everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Back to Basics Bookkeeping for Real Estate Investors and Business Owners. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell, and I'm joined today by a friend and one of my providers and mentors, Renee Daggett. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to be with you, David. It is exciting. My favorite part about doing our weekly webinar series is how much I learn from really smart people like Renee. And what's great is that sometimes if I get a question about a topic, instead of saying, Renee, could you explain this topic for me one-on-one? -on -one, I can say, Renee, why don't we turn this topic into a webinar? If I have this question, I'm sure a lot of people have this question. So that's kind of where today's uh, presentation came from, is just the most common fundamental accounting and bookkeeping questions that uh, I have had as an investor and what our clients have had as investors. So let's get started. A little bit about myself. I am a real estate investor. I own a real estate development company. We have experience in uh, apartments, in, multi in uh, retail, in home building, in uh, office, etc. Uh, I started life as a high school band director. Like everybody, you, you go into that profession that sounds good when you're in high school and then you get a degree in that and you try to make money doing that and then realizing you know teaching band was not a great way to make money so i made a shift about 10 years ago and started investing in real estate and uh, after five years of investing in real estate i became financially independent quit my job teaching band and the rest is history you know i became a self-made multimillionaire in real estate and what's interesting about self-made is there's no such thing. You, know, you, you really are reliant upon the people around you and the education around you. So I really want to encourage everyone who's on the call today that everything is possible for you if you have a plan and a hunger to put that plan into action. And then you surround yourself with the right kinds of people and the right kinds of ideas to take you to that plan. One of those people that has really helped me flourish in my business is Renee Daggett at Admin Books. I remember when my real estate development company was fairly new, my wife was doing all of our accounting and we had a lot of questions. And so we were fortunate enough to meet Renee and her team helped coach us through doing our own accounting. You know, I really didn't want to outsource everything to an accounting firm because I wanted to get the lessons. And so Renee's team helped us uh, through a lot of coaching and doing co-accounting, right? We would do the, a lot of the work ourselves and then get on a call with our mentor at Admin Books and they would help us understand how to keep better accounting records and uh, with some tax strategies as well. So Renee is super, super qualified to be giving uh this talk today. She's a certified QuickBooks consultant. She's an enrolled agent, which is a, a certification that is similar to say a CPA, which is a more common phrase that you hear, but an enrolled agent means that they are authorized to represent you as a taxpayer before the IRS. So if they fill out your tax form, complete your tax uh, return, and the IRS has questions, an EA or an enrolled agent can uh, represent you. She's also a great, great lady, someone you'll all want to get to meet. Uh, her phone number is up there and her website, adminbooks.com, full of great resources. So before we jump into the content, a big disclaimer, you know, you can read this, but basically what we're saying is we're not your advisors and you can't sue us, right? So the information presented today is just education and it's general in nature. This is not tax advice to you, legal advice to you. Um, if you're looking for that type of uh, representation, I'm sure that we can help connect you with that kind of representation. But just by attending today's call today, there is no fiduciary relationship uh, created. There's no client uh, uh, relationship created just by attending today's event. So the reason behind our weekly webinar series is just this. Hassle-free cash flow investing. Our clients are looking for a higher rate of return and they want more profit, but they want to put in less money, less time, and less hassle. And that last one, hassle, is the big one, right? I was just talking to a client yesterday who was a retired 
a senior citizen and she was looking at this uh, real estate deal that would have been great if she were 21 years old and lived local to the property. But being an older person who really wanted to just spend time with her family, uh, it didn't make sense for her to be super active in the management of a C-class apartment building. Um, and so really when you're looking at your returns and your profits, it's not just a reflection of money, right? An accountant or a bookkeeper might just look at your profit divided by cash invested as your ROI and then put time in there as a factor and you have an annualized return. You put hassle in there and that's a vagary, right? That's the philosophy behind uh, investing and what brings abundance to your life. So we're going to focus a lot on some of the more mechanical parts of bookkeeping because if you don't have good records, then it's hard for you to make good financial decisions, both in retrospect and also in forecasting and also in completing your, your tax, you know, your tax returns. So today's very important points. We're going to give you some bookkeeping vocabulary. We call it back to basics. And if there's something that we go by too quickly, um, because their bookkeeping can be complex. So if we go by something too quickly, you can always watch this presentation on video a second time or just email Renee or myself with your question or we have a question and answer session at the end of this presentation. We're going to talk about bookkeeping principles so that when you have that vocabulary and you go talk to your team, you'll be able to put some of those um, words into to principles and then develop your own strategies behind your bookkeeping. So this one slide is a recap of really what we're going to talk about today. There's four different kinds of accounting that we're going to talk about. Cash flow accounting, profit loss accounting, calculating net worth, and tax accounting. And our emphasis uh, is not going to be heavy on tax accounting. That's a completely separate webinar. Uh, that we're going to do, but for the purposes of today, you'll just want to know that it's different. And so what do you use each of these forms of accounting for is different. And how you do the accounting is different. And then who does it is different, right? So when you're day-to-day -day cash flow planning, you don't necessarily need to be a QuickBooks expert. You could do it in Excel or you could do it in, on the back of a napkin, right? When you finally go to do your tax return, if you've got complex uh, taxes, you'll want an accounting software like QuickBooks, et cetera. So without going too far into each of these subjects, let's just start with the beginning and go with some bookkeeping vocabulary. So Renee, can you tell us what is are the three, com the three components to making your net worth are equity, assets, and liabilities. That's your net worth. Can you talk about that concept and what a balance sheet is? Right. Um, so there's two basic financial statements. The first one we're going to talk about is the balance sheet. And there's three components on the balance sheet that you need to have a good understanding of what they are. Um, usually at the top of your balance sheet, it lists assets. And we'll go into some details on that. But basically your bank accounts, your properties, your um, physical assets, maybe computers, etc. Then next on your balance sheet, um, and again, this is a balancing balance sheet. So your assets are going to equal your equity and your liabilities. For definition purposes, liabilities meaning the loans that you have out, whether it's the mortgage loans or lo other people's money that you know you borrowed for uh, this investment. Um, the other part of it is the equity, and equity could be money that you put in, money that you take out and something called retained earnings, which we're going to touch on in a moment. But um, you just need to understand the basics of the balance sheet and how important those items are. Um, because when you're looking at the whole picture, there's things that are going to be on your balance sheet that are not going to be on your profit and loss statement. So um, know that there's two sides to the, um, the statements that you're going to have. Yeah, that's really good. If, for example, when someone, a client of mine says, let me show you my balance sheet, and then I see their income on there from work, I know right away that they have they don't really have a, the, the understanding of the vocabulary behind uh, bookkeeping because income is not a balance sheet item. We're looking for uh, basically 
things that you can sell, that is an asset and an expense that you have to pay off. That's a liability. And anything that's left over is net worth. That's your balance sheet. There's two different ways of classifying assets on your balance sheet. Renee, do you want to talk about financial accounting basis versus generally accepted accounting principles gap uh, and then mark to market assets? Well, you have to remember, I have a lot of clients that will come to me that are investors that will say, you know, um, the balance sheet, it doesn't show the true net worth, what, what my true net worth is. And when you're looking at a ba balance sheet, what happens is you're, you need to record what, the, what you bought the property at, the amount, the purchase price. And that doesn't always reflect what really the property is worth now. Say you bought the property five years ago, whether the property has gone down in value or up in value, um, so many times investors get frustrated because their balance sheet shows the financial, you know, accounting of what they bought the property at and not really what the property is worth. So there's that frustration of, you know, showing it properly to as it would be on your tax return, right? You would show the asset and the liability, but then also what is really your net worth because there's a variance in that because your liability is going to go down, you're going to be paying off that loan, but the asset could go up in value with the equity or it could go down in value with some of the challenges in the real estate market right now. So um, know that there's that dichotomy. Yeah, so to put it really simply, the financial accounting basis is what you bought it for and the market is what it's worth today. I know of a hard money lender that's a private lender. They manage a lot of money for other people and they have their loans on their balance sheet as assets, right? And they have the assets for what the face value of the loan is, but all of their real estate they lend against is upside down. So the real value of those loans would be, you know, they'd have to mark their loans to market what they're really worth. Their accounting, their balance sheet that they keep, they keep it based on a basis because if they had to actually mark to market on their balance sheet, they would be at a loss. They, they would actually have a negative net worth. And when they're trying to go um, do their business, they, they don't want to show their bankers and their investors, et cetera, that they actually have a negative net worth. Uh, so as long as they can keep those assets on their balance sheet on their basis, right, then they're, they look better than they really are. And one thing that investors may want to do is, you know, produce a balance sheet in QuickBooks export that to Excel, and then create the market balance sheet so that you can, you know, see it in numbers, you know, in black and white, because that might make you feel a little bit better knowing what the real market value is versus the accounting numbers that your tax preparer will be plugging into the tax return. And I want you, everyone in the audience to pick up on that really subtle thing that she said, export your QuickBooks to Excel and then start playing with it. Because if you are playing with your numbers directly in QuickBooks, it can get really complicated to try to put them back the way that it was uh, before. Um, so having that in, a, in an exported Excel document makes it a, a fair, fairly easy to change your mind. Is it worth this or is it worth that? Let me change it around. Do some what-if scenarios, like how much Absolutely. asset have to be for me to get a net worth of such and such. Here's an example of what assets could look like, you know, real estate that you own, rental property, assets, businesses that you own or assets, IRAs, cash, stocks. If you've got life insurance that has a cash value, that is an asset, car, personal property uh, are all assets. So you would add all of those up and that's your total assets. Liabilities, anything that you owe, your mortgages, any loans that you personally guarantee, credit cards, uh, if you've taken a loan against your life insurance, student loans, unsecured bank loans, those are all negative numbers and they show as liabilities. So you put those two together. Oh, and then there's the third component, which is equity. When they talk about uh, equity on how that shows on your balance sheet. Yeah, so this is the third component of the balance sheet that many investors miss um, or forget about 
because they know what their assets are and they know what their liabilities are. But equity, I uh, mentioned previously, is money that you put into the company, whether you're an LLC, S Corp, C Corp, whatever your um, business strategy is for your investments, any money that you put into your business or your company, that's equity. But you may have an S Corp and you're pulling distributions out and so that affects your equity uh, number, something that's called basis. And then there's something that's called retained earnings. Also on your equity that kind of goes along with retained earnings is if you look at your, if you have QuickBooks, if you look at your equity section, it will have a line item that will show the profit and or loss for that period of time, whatever the date range that you put in there. But it'll also have another line that will show retained earnings. The retained earnings is good to kind of keep an eye on because the retained earnings is the profits and or losses over the lifetime of the company. So you could have a profit one year, a loss one year, profit one year, and several losses the next year. So it's the combination of the profits and losses over the life of the um, company. A good way to see this is um, looking at your tax return. There's a retained earnings line item on your tax return, so you can take a look at that. I will say that uh, that's probably the number one a number on the QuickBooks file that's usually wrong that, that I tend to see on uh, clients' financial statements is the equity amount. But just don't forget about equity. It's that you know, dark shadow behind the door that um, needs to be, the door needs to be open and you need to kind of keep an eye on what the equity is. It's a tricky term because I think about equity from a real estate investor standpoint, which is my home is worth $100,000 and I owe $80,000, therefore my equity is $20,000. But from a bookkeeping perspective, we're, we're talking about something, I mean, that, that is fundamentally what we're, we're um, looking at, but it always shows on my QuickBooks statement different, which is assets equals liabilities plus equity. Right. So if the asset is a hundred thousand dollar house, the liability is eighty thousand dollars and the equity is twenty thousand dollars. Those balance together to make assets equals liabilities plus equity. And when you're moving, that's why we have the yin yang down there as liabilities get bigger. Your equities get smaller as equities get bigger. Your liabilities get smaller. Correct. And I think there is that. Um shift in the vocabulary of equity just like you said you know you have this asset and over time it will get you know acquire some equity on there um, but in bookkeeping terms equity it means the same thing but it, it kind of acts as an equation as the slide represents mm -hmm. yeah so equity is an asset unless it's negative equity and then it's a liability correct yeah so Interesting. So net worth, you've got your equity plus your assets minus your liabilities. Many people lump equity into assets, but from a bookkeeping perspective, we're going to want to segregate those, uh, segregate those out. And then the important thing is, who cares about your net worth? If you're applying for a loan, particularly a commercial loan, your banker cares about your net worth. Your creditors, anyone who's going to potentially give you a line of credit or sue you, they want to know that you've got something to go collect upon. Your estate taxes are based upon net worth. Your personal vanity, hey, I'm a multimillionaire. That's just vanity, right? You might be a multimillionaire and still be broke because you don't have enough cash in the bank to pay for a taco, right? Uh, accredited investor status is a, deter a term defined by the Securities Exchange Commission that basically allows you to take advantage of certain opportunities or not. Our company, my, my company, oftentimes gets a group of investors together to go buy a commercial property together. And maybe we get 10 people that each put in 10% of the money to go buy it, and we all own it together through a limited liability company. A project like that may only be available to accredited in investors, right? I might only be able to offer that opportunity to people whose net worth is a million dollars or more, excluding their primary residence. And some opportunities can be available to everyone. And so if you're not an accredited investor, 
there's opportunities out there that you've probably never heard of because it's illegal to show them to you. Kind of crazy, but that's true. And if you are an accredited investor and you're not looking at accredited investor opportunities, you're kind of missing the boat. Some of the best investment opportunities out there are for accredited investors. If that's something that you know, you'd like more information on, feel free to uh, contact me, David, at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. Also, your net worth is a form of savings for future withdrawal, right? Because your net worth is when I go to liquidate my assets and I pay off the loans secured by my assets, is there going to be anything left over? And if there is, that represents that you can go convert something into cash or go exchange, you know, equity on your balance sheet or net, I should rather say net worth on your balance sheet, go exchange that net worth for something that you really want to, uh, to use. And David, if I can make a comment on that, um, what you said is really important. You know, over the last five, six years, um, you know, I've really been looking at the balance sheet to look at net worth and bringing it to people's attention as they look at um, their financial statements, you know, looking at your assets, you know, what could you, you know, sell your assets for, the money that you have in the bank, all your investment, you know, that, that's cash, liquid cash, and then can you take that liquid cash, pay off your liabilities, whatever loans that you have, and then what is left over? And I think we we tend to forget about looking at that aspect because net worth is actually very important. Because if you lose sight of that, you know, in in um, the busyness of the days and weeks and months as they go on, you know, you may not have enough assets to pay off your your liabilities and have nothing left over. And so you really want to be in tune with what that number is and, you know, checking it, whether that be quarterly or annually at the most, you know, or at the least, checking it annually and just seeing how that, that number is getting better or if it's getting worse, you know, keeping an eye on it because you may need to make some decisions if that number kind of crosses a line that you don't feel comfortable with. I like using net worth as a long-term uh, target, you know, annually, as you were saying, that's a great time to check your, check your net worth. It's just kind of a health checkup to see which direction you're moving. Are you moving in the positive direction or the negative direction on your net worth? But it isn't something that you want to update on a daily basis. I mean, there's some kinds of accounting or bookkeeping that you will want to update on a, a daily or weekly or monthly basis, but net worth, I don't really think is one of those. I think net worth, I'm really focused upon uh, helping to see if I've set my sale in the right direction. So cash flow, um, I think we should really talk about what cash flow is before we uh, have a debate on whether cash flow versus net worth is, is, is more important. But I, I kind of what I was going with this kind of slide is uh, once upon a time, I had a huge net worth, but I had a cash flow sickness, right? My business was not healthy. Even though my net worth was very, very large, I had more money leaving the bank on a monthly basis than coming in. And I had to sell assets to create cash to pay for cash flow. And when you're in a declining market like we had, you start selling assets at discounted prices just to produce cash flow to, to pay your, your, your monthly expenses. So in, if I had flipped that around where I had created a very healthy cash flow uh, budget or a healthy cash flow um, statement, then I wouldn't ever be forced to sell an asset prematurely, right? So when I'm looking at net worth versus cash flow, net worth is interesting. Cash flow is everything. Cash flow is oxygen. Cash flow is what lets you go from uh, breakfast to lunch to dinner and pay your, your bills. Your grocer doesn't care how big your net worth is. The guy at the restaurant doesn't care how big your net worth is. They want to know, do you have the cash in your pocket to pay for the thing that you want today? So let's look at profit loss. So profit loss is exciting. Um, 
I this is kind of fun because I said to Renee, oh, profit loss is income minus expenses, which is profit. And she corrected me with her secret formula. Yeah, so um, I, I love to have a shift in mindset when it comes to the profit and loss. And you can see my formula there. It's income minus your planned profits equals expenses. So if you want a profit of 10%, then that forces you to live within your means of 90% being in your expenses. And the minute that you spend more than 90%, you're stealing from your profit category. And I think, just like you said, David, at the beginning of your presentation, it's all about planning. You do need to have some type of plan and strategy. Um, otherwise, you're flying by the seat of your pants and just hoping and praying that you don't owe a ton of taxes, but yet that you've had enough profit to have cash flow and increase your net worth. It doesn't work that way. You have to have some type of planning strategy so that all these things are working in sync with each other. And uh, you just can't let things happen and, you know, flying by the sea of your plants and just, I hope I get a profit, but I hope I don't have to pay a ton of taxes. If you shift your mind and plan for a profit, whatever that percentage will be, then you, I think it's easier to feel like you have to live within that expense percentage. Does that make sense? It sure does. As a real estate developer, I used to say I can sell you know, the property for this. Here's the market value. Here's my cost of construction and here's what's left over. And that as a business owner, I just get what's left over. And by using Renee's secret formula, I've been able to shift my mindset to say, what profit do I need to make on this project to make it worth my while to focus on? I know what I can sell it for. That's easy. I know what profit I need to make. And then I get a budget for expenses. And then I go value engineer the product to fit within that expense category. Love it. Yeah. Um, profit loss. Here's an example. So your income from your work, rents received from a property, your business income, interest income from savings, your capital gains from the sale of stock, your uh, those are all items that go on your profit loss, right? Your IRA income, you know, income that's going into your IRA, your IRA has its own profit loss. So until you're taking distributions, that doesn't show on your profit loss. And gains that are inside your life insurance policy, Again, that's inside of your life insurance policy. It doesn't show up on your, your personal uh, profit loss statement. Uh, here's an example of expenses. Everything that leaves, no, I'm sorry, not everything that leaves, but your mortgage is an expense, your credit card's an expense, your interest payments on your uh, loans, interest on life insurance, interest on student loans, et cetera. And David, can I interrupt for a clarification? When you say credit card payments, the charges on your credit card are an expense, but the payments are actually not an expense. So I just want to make that clarification. Anything that you charge on your credit card, you know, say it's for telephone or utilities or whatever it is, um, that item you charge is an expense, but the payment is not. Yeah, I really should change that to credit card interest. Because the interest is an expense, but the thing that you used your credit card to buy, that was the real expense. That's correct. Yeah. So some expenses are deductible from a tax perspective, and some expenses are non-deductible. And the way that I think about deductible versus non-deductible is a deductible expense, I earn money, and then I spend the money. And it's that simple. So $1 of buying power equals $1 of earnings. Every dollar I earn, I can go spend. A non-deductible expense is I've got to go earn the money, pay the tax, and then go spend the money. So a dollar of buying power for a non-deductible expense might only be $1.25 of earnings. I mean, I got to go earn a lot more to have the same buying power. One of the 
bookkeeping strategies or the tax strategies that we're going to talk about is shifting expenses. We want to shift expenses from a non-deductible expense to deductible expenses. And something, you know, good example, the new iPhone 5 is out and it's awesome. I replaced my droid with the iPhone 5 and I'll never go back. I <laughs> awesome. But the iPhone 5 is a deductible expense for my business because I use my iPhone for my business. So my corporation purchased the iPhone. I could have purchased it, you know, so through my uh, schedule C, just sole proprietorship business, but my corporation pur purchased the iPhone and they get to write off the cost of the phone and the cost of the service. Cause I use it for business expense. If one of my employees were to go buy a phone, they'd have to pay taxes on the money and then go buy the phone. So it's deductible for me, but it's non-deductible for them because of the nature of uh, how we earn our income. And that's what's so great about having a business and, and having investments is what are you doing already that is your normal you know, routine that you can take those personal expenses and now that you have a legitimate business, uh, the business expense in your example of the iPhone is ordinary and necessary for conducting business and now you're just taking things that were normally on a personal profit and loss and you're moving it over to a business profit and loss and increasing your buying power you know, dollar for dollar. And that's what you have to do is, you know, how can I make this a uh, legitimate business expense and shift expenses that way? Mm -hmm. It's huge. You're talking 25, 30, 40, maybe even 50% change in your buying power, depending on what your tax bracket is. Absolutely. And that's the power of owning real estate and having a business. And owning real estate is a business because it, it, real estate has income and expenses. So there, it, it is a business. Um, and by shifting those expenses, it's, it's really huge. I'm, I'm going to be taking a trip here to go look at some specific property to buy. And I'm looking at property in, or in Florida and Georgia and Tennessee and in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm going to fly to Orlando and drive to Chicago and it's beautiful time of year. The leaves are changing. It's going to be one of the most beautiful drives uh, out there, but I get to write off the entire trip. Everything on that trip is an ex deductible expense for me because I'm going specifically to buy very specific properties in those, uh, those markets. And that might be a great topic for another webinar is, you know, travel expenses because there's a lot of ins and outs on, you know, what constitutes a business day and when you can take the whole uh, travel expense and when you have to, you know, portion it out for any personal uh, pleasure, meaning say you were going to go visit your sister in one of those stops, you know, how do you calculate that portion of it? So that might be a fun webinar for you to do. Yeah, that would be fun. We should do that one together. Um, tax deductible expenses. So Renee, can you talk about what is deductible and what it might be deductible and what's definitely not deductible? Absolutely. So your mortgage interest is absolutely deductible. Um, the property, property mortgage interest, property expenses, you know, you might have utilities, landscaping, um, management fees, that kind of thing. A student loan interest is deductible on your personal return. Um, taxes that you pay, depending on what your, you know, if you're an LLC, S Corp, all of that, they have different things there. Now, car loan interest may be deductible. Um, there's the big, um, you know, that's another webinar on auto expenses, being able to take actual costs versus um, mileage. So depending on what you're taking there, that might be deductible. Um, food, clothing, personal travel, all of that, as I was saying earlier, is shifting what you're normally doing into a business situation so that you can, you know, deduct that whole trip. Um, vehicle expenses I talked about with, you know, the actual cost as far as gas, uh, insurance, repairs, and then the interest there, comparing that to mileage. Um, there's just so many things that can be deductible, uh, 
depending on your entity, what you're doing. And so really seek counsel on your tax preparer, your bookkeeper, whoever that is, and talk through that and how you can strategize and moving things over to shifting um, items into the deductible column. Mm -hmm. That is the secret is how do you shift the expenses? I mean, I'm going to enjoy this week long business trip. I'm not going to Disneyland or you know, while I'm there, but I'm going to sure have a good time. I like travel. I like seeing beautiful new towns. Um, and by shifting that kind of mixing, you know, business with pleasure, it, it makes that uh, travel uh, more affordable for me. And, and just one little side note there is, you know, Based, you mentioned a corporation and sole proprietorship. Each entity has its benefits. And talk to your tax preparer about your entity and make sure you're getting the benefits there because there's things that are deductible in a sole proprietorship that are not deductible in a corporation and things that are deductible in a corporation that are not deductible in a sole proprietorship. So um, look at what your needs are and make sure that the entity that you're in is benefiting you to have the lowest taxes and the most benefits. Yeah, having a good advisor is really, really critical. And the time to get a good advisor is before you really need it. I mean, when it, I, I kind of joke that if you um, talk to your tax advisor in, in December and you're making a uh, you know, movements of, of, on your balance sheet and movements on your income statement in December, that's good tax planning. If you do that same thing in February, it's called tax fraud. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're preparing uh, in advance for um, for good tax strategy, that, that makes a lot of sense. If you try to uh, in, change the facts that, that happen afterwards uh, because you learned a, a new tax strategy that, that isn't uh, looked on favorably. You can get in trouble. Yes. So profit loss, your income minus your expenses is your profit loss. That's the, 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 the traditional way. I like Renee's secret sauce a lot better. Um, but who cares about this? Your banker cares. That helps your debt to income ratio. That's what your banker looks at. Your creditors care. They want to see that you've got additional income to support new loans. The IRS cares. The IRS doesn't really care about your net worth but they do care about your profit loss because that affects how much tax you pay. And you, you care about your profit loss because if you're losing money, your business is headed in the wrong direction. And if it is making money, it's headed in the right direction. And one thing uh, with that profit and loss number, as you look at that, you know, the difference between your creditors and the IRS is actually ch a challenge. It, it can be very challenging to, strategize with that number. Let me give you an example. Your creditors want that wants that number to be higher so they can give you more money. You know, that's what you want. But when you're dealing with the IRS, you want that number to be lower cuz then you're paying less taxes, right? So it 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 can be it all goes back to your you know, philosophy, what your goals are and um you know, I have clients that they're like I don't care how much the taxes are because I'm making good money and that was that's their goal to be profitable. But other clients, they want the profit to be as low as possible. Um, so know what your philosophy is there and um, try to find that uh, range that you want that number to be in so that you can get the loans that you want but also pay the least amount of tax that you can. This one is going to be kind of a paradigm shifter for some people on the call. Your profit loss is not the same as cash flow, and profit loss is not necessarily your taxable income. So we're going to kind of kind of prove those hypotheses right there. The profit loss is not cash flow. Profit loss is not your taxable income. Those are different forms of accounting that we're going to want to do. So the concept behind uh, not every check you deposit is income. And not all positive cash flow is profit. For example, if you made a loan and someone pays that loan back and you deposit that loan repayment check into your bank account, that's not income. It's a return of your own money. So if you invested in a, pro a project or let's say you bought a property and then you sold it and 
when you get that money back from the sale of the property, some of the money from the sale is your own original investment. And that's not income. It's not profit, right? If you borrow money and you deposit that check in your bank account, that's not income. That's not profit. You have a security deposit where the tenant gives you, you're the landlord and your tenant gives you a security deposit and you deposit that check into your bank account. When you deposit it, that's not income, right? Maybe you prepaid um, for certain items, right? You prepaid some taxes or maybe you overpaid taxes and you get a refund on uh, something that you prepaid or overpaid. When you make that deposit, that's not income or profit. It's just a deposit. Yeah, David, I think um, when you're first learning these basic vocabulary words, you know, not every check you deposit is income. And if you think of what we just talked about, the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet, um, even though you deposit the money and you think that that's something that's supposed to go on the profit and loss, it's really a balance sheet item. So um, having a clear understanding of where you don't have to know the credits and the debits, but just where these numbers are going to be affected. Is it a balance sheet item or is it a P&L item? That's, that so, will help. that's so important. And that's where when you start doing your own books, having the support of someone like admin books to say, look, you should really put that security deposit not on your profit loss, but put it on your balance sheet. For newer business owners, that is just a mind-blowing um, concept. Well, I think it's important to have that affirmation, the confirmation that they're doing it correctly. You know, it's on the right, on the right statement. Just having that affirmation, I think, is really helpful to have that peace of mind. Because when you're learning about the the financial statements, it, it's it can be confusing because you think it's a deposit is an income item. Mm -hmm. Let's flip that same statement around. Not every check you write is an expense and not all negative cash flow is loss. So, for example, if I uh, issue a loan to somebody, I write a check and I lend someone money, I can't deduct that uh, check that I wrote as an expense because it's my money that's going to be repaid someday. An owner draw from a company. Let's say I own a company and I want to take money out of that company. Um, it isn't necessarily an expense when the company sends me that check. And it's not necessarily income when I get it either. So let's say I go make an investment. I write a check to some uh, third-party company to make an investment. You go buy, uh, open a mutual fund account or you go buy a shopping center in partnership with a bunch of other people, etc. Those are not necessarily expenses. Those are shifts in your balance sheet. Security deposit that you pay, that's not an expense. That's a balance sheet item. Prepaid items, deposits into impound escrow accounts. This is a big one here because a lot of my clients, they will say, well, my principal interest taxes and insurance are such and such. I say, well, how do you know that? Well, because I write a monthly check to my mortgage company every month and they have an impound account where they set aside money for taxes and insurance. Renee, is the amount that I send to my mortgage company on a monthly basis for principal interest taxes and insurance, is that an expense? Initially, no. It hits the balance sheet and this money is being held on your behalf. Then when you look at your statements, you'll see that the um, impound account is then paying the taxes and the insurance. And then at that time that it is paid, then it hits your profit and loss. But when you make that initial payment, it hits your balance sheet as an asset account because the bank is holding that money for you. And that's kind of a tricky one because sometimes you might be sending $1,000 a month to your escrow company and at the end of the year, they have extra money. You sent them too much money. So you've got a cash flow concern which is you've been sending $1,000 a month. And then at the end of the year, your impound account or your lender didn't use all of that money for your taxes and insurance. So they've got some money left over in the bank's account and lenders aren't usually you know, eager to just let that money back out to you, right? I mean, it's your money, but it's, it's sometimes complicated to get at it. Payments to credit cards. Renee, you were talking about this earlier. 
Right. Um, the expense when you swipe your credit card at any you know store or for any p purchase, whether it's travel, whatever it is, the time that you swipe the card, that's the deduction. But it is not an expense. You don't get to deduct the payment to the credit card companies, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more on an upcoming slide. Yep. So repayments of loan principal are not an expense. So if I borrow money and then I pay it back, that repayment of the loan, it affects my cash flow for sure, but it is not an, an expense. So one of the things that's important to understand is that we all have multiple income statements and multiple balance sheets, right? Your IRA has its own income and its own balance sheet. If you have a C Corp, right, that, that has its own, uh, maintains its own balance sheet, an S Corp, a partnership, LC, et cetera. And then all of these different balance sheets that are maintained, when they send money to you personally, it's called something different. So when your IRA makes a profit loss or it has uh, its net worth go up or down, that's an income and a balance sheet inside your IRA. When that IRA interacts with you, your IRA is sending you distributions. And then those distributions impact your personal income statement and balance sheet. When a C Corp sends you money, then it's dividends. When an S Corp or LLC or partnership sends you a percentage of profit or loss, then it shows up on a K-1 or a partnership form. When you have a, a trust account or an impound account, like your lender is holding an impound account or your property manager is holding a, a broker trust account for you. They have income and they have expenses and those are going to show up on your, your personal return or whoever that broker trust account was held for the benefit of. And they're going to send you a reconciliation statement. So even though you didn't necessarily receive the income and you didn't necessarily have the expense, if it happened for your benefit through a trust account or an impound account, then those reconciliation statements are what are used to update your personal income statement or balance sheet. Renee, do you have any thoughts on that? I was just going to say, well said. Oh, fantastic. Uh, got multiple personalities on that, that last slide. Yes, yeah, yeah. So when you're trying to put everything together, you might have lots of different income statements and lots of different balance sheets and they kind of all work together like the cogs of a gear, but they're still separate. And, and that can get kind of complicated the more complicated your financial profile works. And also one of the great things about this multiple income statements, multiple balance sheets, is you have the ability to income shift and expense shift between these different balance sheets. The general idea is you can create a tax strategy behind using multiple balance sheets and income statements and shifting the income and expenses between them with the help of a good advisor. Absolutely, and using calendar years, maybe a C-Corp with a fiscal year being you know, a service-based managerial thing and you're moving things um, between C-Corp and LLC, between LLC and S-Corp, you know, S-Corp goes to your personal, you know, there's a great strategy um, when you have multiple uh, ways of earning income and being taxed, and there's some um, great ways that you can strategize with that. I think that's the main point there. Uh, cash flow statement is hugely important, right? Your receivables minus your payables is your change in your cash flow, but your actual cash flow is starting balance plus the receivables. That's the amount of money coming in and then the money going out. Not all receivables are income and not all payables are expenses. It's just the net change in the amount of money in your bank account is uh, is cash flow. I see people having trouble with cash flow because it's hard to, you know, think about money coming in, when it's coming in, and juggling that with payables going out. And um, I've had clients come to me and say, you know, I just can't figure out a budget. And I usually will say to them, start this way. Start with a zero-based budget. And let me briefly explain what that means. Is You have so much money coming in, so much money going out. If you create a budget with your taking the history of your expenses, 
and the history of your income so that you have allocated where your payables are going to go and knowing what your receivables are, your payables are, and have that be a zero amount. I know it's hard to describe here in the 30 seconds, but um, because there's such an ebb of flow of money coming in, people being on commission or self-employed and, and it being, um, you know, what do I want to say is that you're not paid on a consistent W-2 basis. Um, sometimes it's hard to kind of kind of capture that, um, it's like a ghost in the room and you're trying to grab onto that ghost because it's ever changing, ever moving. You can't really grasp onto it because it's uh, moving so much. Something that's very interesting in this context of real estate investing, a lot of investors focus on the cash flow, which is important. My personal investment philosophy, I want to own properties that are plus $1 cash flow, right? That's, that's important. I want it to be plus one. But my profitability is separate from cash flow because it's very possible that I have rents come in uh, that are very, very high, and I have payables that go out that are mostly loan amortization. Right? I might be making great profit on the property because I use the tenant's rent to pay off the mortgage. Maybe I get that mortgage paid off in, in 15 years or 20 years, something like that. And so my cash flow is low, but my profit is high. And so when you're looking at determining how well a property is, is cash flowing, that's an important metric. For me, I want it to be plus one or better. But for me, what's more important is profitability. I, I want to see what's the actual cash on cash return on investment. This is an interesting one, depreciation. Um, depreciation, Renee, why, would you talk about depreciation? Sure. So depreciation is an amount that the IRS comes up with that they're going to allow you to deduct over the, t the life of the asset. And so say you purchase a home, a piece of property, and you're able to deduct or get a deduction for the 27 and a half years of the life of the property, and you're going to be able to get that extra deduction. So it affects your cash flow because it's really not coming out of your pocket, um, but your asset is depreciated and the basis will go down uh, showing that the asset say it's worth let's just say a hundred thousand dollars and each year I'm going to add a depreciation cost onto that so that the basis will go down on that asset does that make sense it does yep it does so there's different depreciation schedules and the general idea behind depreciation is there's parts of things that wear out and there's parts of things that don't wear out and so uh, certain things wear out faster than others, like software wears out a lot faster than a house will. And so would you talk about how you would take a different asset and depreciate it over a different length of time? Yeah, the IRS has pretty strict rules on what items are depreciated over a certain amount of time. So furniture is always seven years, computers are always five years, and residential 27 and a half. But there's things that you can do to accelerate depreciation. There's bonus depreciation, there's 179 depreciation. And here's where you really need to talk to your tax professional and have that strategy of, do I want to write off all my software, computer, and furniture in one year to, in a sense, create a loss for that year or do I anticipate having higher profits in the next five to seven years and I want to be able to take the deduction over a period of seven years so you have to be in tune and ask your preparer are you taking the whole amount or are you putting it over the uh, you know seven year period and it's good for you. you need to know that that's important for you to know because some preparers will just guess what you want what they think is best but maybe that's not what's best for you because they're not um, in tune with what your strategy is for the next three or five years so very much communicate what um, what the depreciation is going to be taken on your assets mm -hmm. that's great the reason I like depreciation is it allows me to take a loss before I sell the asset 
So the general concept is if I bought something for a dollar and then I sold it for 80 cents because it kind of had worn out, I get to a loss that I get to deduct. But before I actually sell the item, depreciation lets me take a loss on my, uh, on my tax return. So depreciation plays in really well with this next uh, concept, which is phantom income and phantom loss. Phantom income creates a cash flow problem and phantom loss is a cash flow bonus. So I really like phantom losses. As a real estate investor, I get phantom losses all the time. A phantom loss is where my bank account got bigger, but my tax return shows that I made a loss. And how do we, Renee, how do we get phantom losses? So there's several ways that you can do this. And I love this because it's an aha moment because most people don't think of depreciation as we just talked about or auto expenses or home office. When we, when we have a profit and loss in front of us, we have income minus expenses equals the profit, right? Well, in, tax, in the tax world, you get to take additional expenses for depreciation, because you didn't put money, extra money out for that $6,000 of depreciation that you're taking on your Schedule E. But also for home office, say you um, have a home office, you're using it regularly for your investments, and you're using it exclusively for your investments, you can take a portion of your home as a deduction if you qualify, and that can also reduce your losses. You're already paying for it personally, but you're taking out the business portion. The same is true for auto expenses. If you don't track that on your profit and loss, maybe you're tracking that outside of there. Again, you can take the mileage rate or the actual uh, expenses multiplied by the business use. There's a bunch of numbers going into there. And so just taking it, let's just do the mileage rate. If you're taking 50 and a half cents per mile for all the business miles that you've driven, that's going to kind of give you that bonus, that cash flow bonus um, on your business returns. Now switching to the phantom income, this was an aha moment for me. Um, this is actually a cash flow problem. And let me paint the picture this way. You have $100,000 worth of credit card debt. And you say, this is the year I'm going to reduce my credit card debt. I'm sick of it. I want to get rid of the debt. I'm, you know, I just want to increase my net worth. That was your goal. Well, you start aggressively paying off the credit cards. And remember what I said earlier, payment of a credit card is not an expense. It's hitting your balance sheet to reduce your liability, which affects your net worth, right? But it actually can cause a cash flow problem because say you spent $50,000 in one year to pay off that credit card debt. That means $50,000 is gone out of your bank account, and it's not a deduction on your profit and loss. So you're going to show a nice profit there. And the problem would be is if you have this nice profit, the IRS is going to say you have this tax bill and you're going to have no money in your bank account to pay for the tax. Does that make sense? It sure does. It happens to real estate developers all the time because when we sell a property, sometimes we don't get to keep the profit created. We have to use that profit to pay down our loan. And so phantom income can be created. Here's just an example of depreciation of a residential property. So the purchase price is 300. You don't get to depreciate the whole purchase price you only get to depreciate the structure. So if the land just hypothetically is worth 25,000, the structure is worth 275,000, you depreciate it over 27 and a half years, you get annual depreciation of $10,000 a year. So when you buy the property, your tax basis is what you paid for it, 300,000. After the first year, you've depreciated it to 90, second year, 280, et cetera. After seven years, let's say you depreciated it down to a $230,000 basis. It doesn't mean that it's worth 230,000, it just means that's what your tax basis is. And the IRS cares about basis because basis affects your tax. Gain is your sales price minus your current tax basis. Profit is your sales price minus your acquisition price, right? As an investor, I care about profit. I wanna make profit. The IRS doesn't care about profit, they care about gain. 
So maybe I bought a property for uh, $300,000 and I sold it for two hundred and ninety. dollars Well, that's a loss. As an investor, that's a bummer. I lost ten grand, And I should be able to take a deduction for my loss. But in this situation here, you sold it for two ninety. dollars Your tax basis was two thirty. dollars because we depreciated it for seven years and the IRS says, ta-da, you have a $60,000 gain. And you say, wait, how do I get a gain, a taxable gain when I lost money? Even worse, maybe you didn't actually uh, get all the money, all right? It's possible that you don't have the money from this particular sale to pay the tax and that that's a problem. The difference between gain and profit. And gain is taxed at an ordinary income tax rate. That's one time, sometimes why you see people will do uh, 1031 exchanges or tax deferred exchanges, even though they don't have any cash uh, from the proceeds of sale because they're trying to move that tax basis forward into a different property. In this particular situation where the person sold it for a loss, but they still have a gain, that's called depreciation recapture. They're having to recapture some of that depreciation because they told the IRS their property had depreciated in value by $70,000 when in fact it only decreased in price by 10 grand. So they, they get to recapture that depreciation all at once. And so they get a, a tax bill. Um, taxable income is your gross income minus your expenses less the depreciation. That's what's left is your taxable income. Then you take that taxable income times your tax rate that's the income tax that you pay, less any credits you paid, less anything that you previously paid for taxes, and that's the amount that you uh, owe or have, have to pay. So we're up against the clock here. This is just kind of a recap of what we talked about today and really just encouraging you, if you do have questions, reach out to Renee, reach out to myself. We're very happy to answer questions via email. If you registered for this event or if you're watching on video, uh, really encourage you to visit my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. There's going to be an opportunity uh, for you to download a great report that Renee has written. Um, one's called 20 Things Every Business Owner Must Know. She's also written a great article on managing properties using QuickBooks. And if you registered for this event, you'll get that email to you automatically. So look for an email from David at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. If you're watching this on video, be sure to visit my website under the eBooks section and look for that free report by Renee Daggett. It's fantastic. And I really wanna thank Renee for participating on our webinar today and giving us great, great content. Great to hang out with you, David. And thank you everyone for attending today. May you have a successful and prosperous future.